That is awesome. Welcome. Today we're in part three of our current series called Fresh Faith. And the idea behind this series was simple. We wanted to uh, fall more in love with the things that God loves. And as a church, as the church, right, we stand before the world and claim to have been changed by the power of God, by his spirit. And that's quite a claim. And in fact, it invites criticism from the, those peering in from the outside. And if church's history has taught us anything, it's that the outside world is winning the game of influence. What I mean is that we see way more believers choosing to compromise on things that matter to God than we see unbelievers turning in a life of sin for a relationship with God. Truth is, lukewarm Christians are way more dangerous to the local church than sold out sinners. Like, for real. I mean, at least sinners are committed to something, right? Now, Malachi covers some difficult topics for us, and while I know we aren't sending you home during this series with the feel-goods, uh, we wanted to press in anyways because it's important to God, and we wanted to make it clear uh, that it's important to us, and, and God says he will not be mocked, and so we want to talk about these things. And, and God's grace, folks, it's, it's not there to free you up to live the way you want without consequences. Right? It, God's grace is there to free you up so that you can begin to dismantle the things in your life that God does not love so that your life can then be a living testimony to the power and greatness of God. So week one of Fresh Faith uh, showed us that his people, God's people, matter to him. You matter to God. Kristen and I are working on helping our kids uh, memorize God's word. In fact, that was my New Year's resolution this year. Um, And so we're working on scripture memorization as a family. And we're memorizing, uh, this is one of the verses we're working on right now. I suggest uh, strongly that you commit it as well if you don't already have it. Uh, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus Christ is the only way to move from sin to righteousness. But can I be honest, the journey isn't complete there. In fact, look, look what Christ commands of those that seek to follow him. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. You remember when this happened in your life? Do you? I, I remember the day that I exchanged my life of sin for a new life of righteousness. And guess what? The next day, I still woke up with an addiction that I had to, I had to deal with. Like, can we, can we have that kind of, Multiple, actually. And I had to push back against it. And so when Jesus says, come after me, he is making it clear that for those of us who have accepted this, this free gift of God's grace, he's reminding us that we must daily live in obedience to Christ. And this is not easy. Opposition is swift in the lives of those who live by faith. Revelation chapter 2 says, you have forsaken the love you had at first. It seems almost daily there is temptation to turn away from our obedience and our dedication and turn back to the things we had before we had Christ. The addiction that I mentioned before, since I was 14 years old, I need you to know, I had a coping mechanism. It's otherwise known as an idol. Okay? And it was chewing tobacco. Okay? I know, gross. I accepted God's free gift of grace, but still tried to justify that addiction. You hear me? It took me years to hand that over. And even then, I would fall back occasionally into that habit. I must daily refuse to compromise in my commitment to obedience. Daily. In fact, I've, I've gone from justifying So now I've learned to hate that. Like, hear me out. Though many of us have made Jesus our Lord and Savior, we are not immune to disobedience. We are not immune to compromise. See, a true believer will desire obedience even while imperfectly pursuing it. In fact, that's what makes God's love so radical, so wonderful, so amazing, right? It's also what makes their hatred so strong. It's our hypocrisy. I want you to know, God hasn't moved 
on you. Okay? Like, it's not like a game of hide and seek, and every time you mess up, God's in a new spot hiding somewhere, and you must find him all over again. No. Like, you, you mess up, and God is pulling up a lawn chair next to you saying, you done yet? Like, those things, they didn't work last time. Why are you trying again? Stop, stop falling for their schemes. Stop listening to their lies. It wasn't fulfilling the first time you did it. It's not going to be fulfilling now. Come home. Complete satisfaction is found in my son and my son alone. So God is right here. He's waiting. He's in this place. He's waiting. And that's how much you matter to him. And it's that kind of love and it's that kind of just depth of grace that pushes back sin and darkness in our lives. See, Malachi was speaking to people that weren't taking God seriously. They had forgotten who he was, what he had done, what he had promised to do. And so that's the first lesson from Malachi. God's people matter to him. Last week, we saw that our worship matters to God. This is huge. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That phrase, so that no one can boast. Let me just be clear. There is nothing wrong with boasting in the grace of God. In fact, what is worship but an outpour of appreciation for who God is and what he's done? Worship is boasting in God. He deserves your best, nothing less. What you value will be seen in what you do. A tree is known by its fruits. Jesus spoke to this in the Gospel of Luke. He says, a a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So my prayer then is that our hearts would be full of God's words, his, his promises, his assurances, his provisions, his grace and his love that we would all just be jam-packed with those things, right? Because the heart of the tr- about the truth of God pushes back darkness. Our worship is an outpour of what we believe to be true about God. Our worship matters to God. And today, we're going to see that our faithfulness matters to God. A little girl one day was talking to her grandmother who had a massive wedding ring and she said, Grandma, way back when you got married to Grandpa, why did they make the rings so big? And Grandma said to her granddaughter, because way back when we got married, they made rings to last. Today it feels more like what this bride said. She said, when I got married, I was looking for the ideal Instead, it became an ordeal, so now I want a new deal. See, for many of us in our circles, divorce has become normal. And I would, I would imagine that nearly everyone in this room and at home on some level has been impacted by divorce. Over 50% of marriages end in divorce. Yes, that includes Christian marriages as well. That's the sixth highest divorce rate in the world. And one of the reasons that's actually not higher is because couples have found common interests outside of the marriage. Maybe they agree to stay married because, you know, they want to keep the kids doing well in that area. They're doing it for the kids. Or, or maybe it's a better financial situation or decision if they just tough it out and stick it out for the next few years. A man went to the Super Bowl and he was sitting there with an empty seat beside him. The guy behind him asked his is that your seat? I haven't seen anyone sit next to you. He said, yeah, it's, it's mine. My wife and I had tickets, but she passed. I invited a couple buddies, but no one could make it, so it's empty. He said, none of your friends could make it to the Super Bowl? He said, no, they couldn't. The guy said, that's crazy. I mean, the, the biggest sporting event of the year, and they turned it down? He said, yeah, they're at my wife's funeral. See, our our culture, though, it's it's true, has devalued the marriage covenant. 
We have. We've placed other things above it. Divorce has been so widely accepted that it's become a cultural norm in our society. And then, and then you, you get in the Word of God and, and you start reading and you start asking, what does God think about this? And it's shocking. I need to warn you. The, the, the funny stuff is over. What I'm about to share with you today is not widely accepted. It's, it's, it's not popular, okay? But it's, it's not often in our relationship with God that popular and biblical align, okay? So that's okay. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather be confronted with an uncomfortable lie than a comfortable, or sorry, an uncomfortable truth than an, a, a, a comfortable lie. See, Malachi, it do, he doesn't hold back. He comes right at it, and he's not PC about it either. He's not out to make friends or grow his brand. He wants to tell you God's view on the matter. And now I, I know that as we unpack this, there's many different stories in this room. We have those who are divorced. We have those who are, are divorced and remarried, those who are separated and, and, and are maybe considering divorce. I know that I know that we're going to be touching on some sensitive areas. And I need you to know there's a balance that I hope to find today because we want to be centered in biblical truth while also being compassionate and full of grace. But our desire to to, to show compassion and offer grace can't keep us from truth, just as truth should not be spoken without love and compassion. Throughout the book of Malachi, there is this discussion between God and his people. God is calling them out for wasting their worship, right? They're coming to church, they're singing and praying and preaching, but God keeps saying throughout the book that he's not paying attention to any of it. It's just noise. And in chapter 2, we get the reason for God not accepting their worship. God is not pleased. Here's why. Look at verse 10. Do we not all have one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another? See, Israel was always meant to reflect God to the surrounding nations. That was the plan. God is faithful. Israel was to put that faithfulness on display for the world to see. Instead, what we see is they were unfaithful to one another. Instead of keeping promises, they changed their minds. I love what John says about this. 1 John chapter 4, he says, If we say we love God, yet hate a brother or sister, we are liars. For if we do not love a fellow believer whom we have seen, we cannot love God whom we have not seen. Verse 11 gives us more about why God is not pleased in this exchange. Check it out. Judah has been unfaithful. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship a foreign god. Okay, so we don't just have a personal issue. Now we have a national crisis, right? You thought COVID was bad? This is bad, all right? Malachi is calling out the men who were divorcing their wives and remarrying other women. They were divorcing their wives, they were remarrying other women, and then they were bringing these women in to the, to the house of worship that worship other gods. You remember verse 10? Did not one God create us? Right? So you bring these women that have a different God flavor for every day of the month, you're, you're You're going to leave your wife who shares your faith and marry a woman that can't even name all the gods that she claims. And worst of all, you're going to bring her into the house of the Lord. You're going to bring her into my house? Really? Really? Whether you're single or a parent of a single or a grandparent of a single, there is a reason that God's word teaches us not to marry non-Christians. There there is a reason that that we should be teaching this to those that are in our care. We should be influencing them with God's direction, not the world's. Our sons and daughters, they should have boundaries as they set out on the dating scene, period. And this should be boundary number one. 
There's a reason why I always told the girls in my youth group not to be out there missional dating because a Christian in relationship with a non-Christian invites spiritual conflict. Always, okay? Marriage is hard enough. Can I get an amen? Marriage is hard enough without the added clash of gods that comes from different sets of beliefs. In fact, Paul tells the Corinthians, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? See, it's clear that marriage is a deeply spiritual issue. Not a, not, it's not a human issue. It's not a social issue. And it's definitely not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. That's, that's why I could care less about what a court system says marriage is. You can define it all you want, but marriage is defined in God's word, not in a courtroom. I'll just leave it there for now, okay? Actually, I, I won't. Verse 12, <laughs> as, as for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord remove him from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings an offering to the Lord Almighty. Look, listen to me. No one gets to redefine marriage. The second that you redefine marriage, it becomes something else, but it is not marriage. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. There are three things required for a biblical marriage. A man, a woman, and mutual faith in the one true God. You, you don't get to remove God from something he created and established. You don't get to remove him from that. That'd be like you claiming that Bill Gates invented your iPhone. Um, no, right? Like Bill Gates invented mediocre office software. Like you, you don't get to take that from Steve Jobs. Don't even try. Let's keep moving. Something tells me we'll touch on that later. See, the people that Malachi is speaking to, they were troubled. Well, what's on their mind, Josh? Well, God was not answering their prayers. Look at verse 13. Another thing you do you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands, right? So they were cut off from God. God didn't want anything to do with their hypocritical acts of worship. And they're upset because God isn't answering their prayers. But he's not answering their prayers because they care more about what they want than what God wants for them. Did you notice verse 12? As for who? The man. Now, fellas, I know this might be awkward, maybe a bit uncomfortable, maybe uneasy for you, but when God is cleaning up the loose ends in his kingdom, you want to venture a guess as to who he starts with? Yeah, you. That doesn't mean that women get a free pass. Doesn't mean she's perfect. But when it comes to being held accountable, men, you get to go first. In fact, in Genesis 3, God says, Adam, where are you? Not Eve, where are you? Not Adam and Eve, where are you? Just Adam. And if you look at Genesis 3, look, it doesn't mean she doesn't have consequences. It just means that God starts with the man. You are the leader of the household, man. The buck stops with you. I was taking uh, Madison to school last Monday. None of us were feeling well. And um, so I was telling her that I was just going to zoom in for my meetings, right? And she thought it was so cool. She was like, so you just get to decide that? You don't have to ask anyone for permission? I was like, I was like no, I'm it. <laughs> it's approved, you know? And she thought that was so cool, you know? She's like, that's awesome. But I quickly explained to her that I might get to make decisions like zooming in on a meeting, but when I make the wrong decision, who do people point to first? She thought it was much less cool after that. And it is, because the, 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 the pro of being a leader is that you get to make the call, right? The con of being a leader is that when it doesn't go well or you make the wrong call, you're called on first. Look, since Israel's return from Babylon in exile, the, the family unit is suffering. And can I just... The evil one loves to attack the family unit. Okay? 
There's, there is a reason that organizations exist in 2022 to destroy the patriarch. There's a reason. And men, we must stand against it. We, we have an obligation to keep God at the center of our families. The family suffers when men fail to be faithful. And so we have all these illegitimate divorces and illegitimate remarriages and they're taking place in the house of God and religious leaders are failing to call it out and they're failing to address it and God is upset which I just want to say I just want to clarify we will talk about difficult things in this place this will be the kind of church that talks about hard things okay because I want to honor God in what we do we will always talk about difficult things and so these religious leaders they weren't doing that and God's upset and look at verse 14 you ask why it is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth you have been unfaithful to her though she is your partner the wife of your marriage covenant and we need to spend some time with this word covenant because God takes his covenant seriously you signed a marriage certificate when you got married I hope so because if otherwise you're still dating right See, that's legally binding. And a covenant is, is how God operates in that space. It's a ling- legally binding relationship that God operates by. And so if you stood before God and you looked into the eyes of your bride-to-be and you made promises to her before God Almighty and before your family, then you entered the marriage covenant. Now, l- let's talk about this, right? Malachi says, the wife of your marriage covenant. Let me be clear about something, okay? The marriage covenant is not about your happiness, right? I mean, many people, they get married to be happy. Now, I'm, I'm not saying you can't be happily married, but that's not the purpose of marriage. Many people, they buy into this, like, I'm going to get married. That's like my next step towards life being complete and me being happy. The problem is once you make happiness the purpose, when you're no longer happy, which will probably happen, I don't know, talk to the people who've been married for 66 years. Maybe they'll tell you, all right? But at some point, you might not be happy, and you'll want to trade it in. You'll want to trade that car in for a different one, right? When the honeymoon phase ends, you'll still be looking for your happiness. God's covenants, they aren't about your happiness. They are there for your faithfulness. They're there to grow you in your faithfulness and grow God's kingdom and his glory in that kingdom. Right? And so if you, if you partner with someone with the goal of your happiness in mind, you'll never get there because somewhere down the road, they'll start to wonder about their own happiness. And eventually everyone will look around and realize no one's happy. You remember what God said to Adam and Eve? He blessed them and then he said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Love God enjoy him, make babies, teach them to love and enjoy him and live according to his glorious purpose for your life. See, the heart of biblical marriage recognizes that God is supreme and you are not. You aren't adjusting to your spouse. Okay? You both should be adjusting to God together. Kristen and I have been married for 10 years, which after watching that slideshow, we now realize is not impressive. <laughs> but I think my wife is stunning. I think she's smoking hot. I do. I, I still can't in- believe that it happened. Like, there was a day when Kristen looked at me and thought it'd be a good idea to marry me, and then she actually did. <laughs> like, what? Right? Like, this isn't a joke. And, and, and I got to say, as beautiful as my wife is and as wonderful as she is to look at, the most enjoyable thing about her has been watching her come alongside me in ministry and serve the Lord right there with me. Like, honestly, it's become one of the most attractive things about her. Like, it's, it's pretty hot, okay? Watching her lead the women's ministry seeing her love for God, seeing her desire to love and encourage women in the church, I, I just, I've fallen in love with her all over again. The other day, we got invited to watch a student from our youth ministry many years ago share her story from addiction back to God. 
and this was a student, I gotta be honest with you, I'll share my lack of faith with you, this was a student we never thought would find her way back to God. Yet every time, despite our doubts, every time that student would call Kristen, she made, a, she made time. She made it a priority. And now she's finally returned to a relationship with God some, what, 10, a decade later. See, watching my wife pursue God has kept me on fire for her. I mean, you go to marriage counseling, you pray, pay a pre- pretty penny to sit down and, and, and somebody to analyze your marriage, and they'll be, the, the first question they'll ask you is how many, a week, how many times a week do you guys, you know, like that's going to fix something. No. You want marital advice? I'm not licensed, by the way, so don't like, you know. But marital advice, I, I'll ask you about your serve life. Seriously. Have you both made God your highest priority or is it more of a hobby for you? Because happiness doesn't come when you find the one. It comes when God is number one. One of the best ways that I've heard biblical marriage portrayed is with the picture of a triangle. I got it on the screen for you guys. Every line on this triangle represents a relationship, right? And so the husband and the wife, they, they form the bottom two corners of the triangle and God forms the top. Both the husband and the wife, they have an individual relationship with God, hence the vertical line there. The vertical diagonal line represents our relationship with God and then we have a relationship with each other, which is represented by the, the, the horizontal line there. And so as the spouses grow closer uh, to God in their personal relationship and walk with Christ, they also grow closer to one another, right? And so when each spouse has a healthy, vibrant, growing relationship with God, their love for Christ is seen and reflected in their marriage. But when the relationship with God suffers, when it grows stagnant and when it begins to slide down, so too does the intimacy between a husband and a wife. So the closer the couple gets to God, the closer they get to one another. I just love that picture. I think it would be a great addition to any wedding ceremony. Problem is, I don't think triangular rings would sell well. But anyways, verse 15, he repeats himself, has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard. And do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. See, every person has three parts to them. In fact, it's common during a wedding ceremony to offer all of these parts to you, uh, to the one that you intend to marry. And the three parts are body, soul, and spirit. See, body enables you to function in the physical world. Soul is who you are. It's your personality. It's what you're like, right? Spirit is the covenant. It's it's our link to the spiritual. It's our link to God. And so we have these three things in us, right? If your foundation, and, and really in anything, if your foundation isn't in the spirit, then you have nothing to fall back on when the body fails you or when the soul changes, And so that's what you have. You have people married today, married by body. They were attracted to a person. And so they got married. Well, then the person doesn't stay attractive. Right? What do you do then? You have others who are married because they like a person's personality. Maybe they were ugly, you know, but man, they really had it going up here, you know? And so they got hitched because of it. Which is sad because... When you actually share a connection with Almighty God with your spouse, it creates an intimacy that you cannot imitate anywhere else. It can't be found. Finally, in verse 16, God gives us through Malachi his feeling about divorce. I debated which version to use here, but honestly, none of them are easy to hear. I'll read from 16. The man... Who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. If you thought that was rough, another version says, without flinching, I hate divorce, says the Lord God. During this series, we've said that we want to learn to love the things God loves. 
in a way, if you want to learn to love what he loves, you could also learn to hate what he hates. So, so we should hate divorce too, right? Can I just tell you, it's not unusual for God to call us away from social and cultural norms. I mean, we live in a time that has normalized divorce. We've gotten so comfortable with it that it's a non-issue. But how can we be so comfortable with something that God is so clearly not comfortable with? Remember verse 15? God seeks what? Godly offspring. See, God is calling out a generational issue here. It's about the children and the grandchildren. He says to them, your decision to divorce, it's not just about you. It's not just about your happiness. What you've done is set things in a downward motion for your children. You have set something terrible in motion and you're seeing it play out today. Your children saw you break covenant and are more likely to do it themselves than your grandchildren and their grandchildren. So the violation of this covenant has set some horrible and and, and violent things in motion against those that you're called to protect. That's what Malachi is telling these men. All right. Now that it's super quiet in here, let's turn to Matthew 19. Some 400 years later, Jesus becomes the God-man and picks up this conversation in the flesh with some Pharisees. Let's check it out. Some Pharisees came to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Okay, so these Pharisees, they're trying to trick Jesus. In other words, they show up and they say, hey, um, can I get a divorce based on incompatibility? We're just growing apart. Can, can, we, can we get divorced because of communication problems? Because she just doesn't talk to me anymore. What if she can't cook, Jesus? Can I get a divorce then? In other words, do I really have to have a reason? Like, I don't want to be with her anymore. I can't stand her. I can't live with her anymore. Whatever the reason, do I even have to have a reason? And Jesus answers in verse 4, doing his own version of in your face here, as we've seen so much in Malachi. He says, haven't you read? Can't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female? Okay, so Jesus decides to go back and talk about marriage when he's asked about divorce. But let's talk about this, okay? In one sentence, Jesus smashes two very polarizing issues in our culture. Gay marriage and the discussion on gender. Can we just start with gay marriage? It's it's male and female. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Male and female. Marriage is between a man and a woman, period. Look, if you want to be united in something... As a a gay couple, if you want to be united in something, that's your business, but it's not marriage. That's, That's not my opinion either. This is God's word. The state might recognize it as marriage, but God does not. At least that's what I'm seeing in God's word. Also, the creator didn't make she, it's, them's, they's, and he's, it's. Just just two, male and female. So anyone that claims to be neither male or female is confused. God created two, man and woman. And me saying this, it's not oppressive, it's just the truth. So Jesus continues this conversation in verse five, for this this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined, let no one separate. In other words, Jesus says, hold on, guys. If you, wanna, if you really want to understand divorce, can we talk about marriage again? Because divorce occurs when they no longer, when they aren't one. They're still two. Right? God didn't design marriage for two to remain two. He designed marriage so that he could take two and make them one. It's similar to his plan to reconcile humanity to himself. God's promise to love, protect, and provide for his people, his church, his bride, for us. It shows us that God is in the business of bringing things together, not keeping them apart. So they ask the question in verse 7, 
why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? If there's not supposed to be divorce, Jesus, then why did Moses command it? But look at what Jesus says. He replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. Did you see the different use of words there? They, they, they say, why did Moses command it? But Jesus said, Moses never commanded it. He permitted it. And he only permitted it for one reason. What was it? Hard hearts. So what is a hard heart? A hard heart is a heart that refuses to surrender to God. And so when divorce is on the table, there's a hard heart somewhere. It's somewhere. There's either a man or woman who is in stubborn rebellion against God. They're unwilling to bring their marriage to God and breathe spirit back into that marriage. Truth is, oftentimes the person doesn't want God to fix it. They don't want reconciliation. They want to wash their hands of it. They want it to be over. And that's what these Pharisees were talking about. God doesn't lower his standards to make us feel better. He's not saying, well, you know, it's 2022 now. You know, it's widely accepted. Everybody's divorced. Let me, let me adjust to you guys. <laughs> no. He says, this is the standard. I do not change. I do not compromise. This is it. Not because I hate you, because I love you and I want what's best for you. It's because of hardened hearts. I allowed it. So then when is it allowed? Look at verse 9. Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So Jesus gives an exception and so does Paul. The, the two exceptions are immorality and abandonment. They walk. Physically, mentally, financially, they leave their role as wife or husband. The, the, the man abandons the home or, or refuses to be a husband but might still be in the home. How disastrous is that? Maybe, maybe he's selling stuff from the house to fund his unhealthy habits. Maybe he doesn't want to work or, or maybe there's physical abuse or mental or emotional abuse. And I, I don't want to just pick on the guys. Women can abandon their roles too. They can search for intimacy outside the marriage just as much as a guy can. They can refuse their role as wife just like the man. These are grounds for divorce because God as the witness has seen that he or she has been unfaithful. Look, the point is this. If you have to get a divorce, you should hate that you had to get it. You should, you should hate it for your children. You should, we should hate it for our families. We should hate it for ourselves because divorce sucks. It sucks. And we should, we should mourn broken covenants, but not without hope. Listen, if divorce was completely avoidable, then God would not have permitted it through Moses. And this heavy-handed phrase from Malachi, I hate divorce. It just, man, it just rattled me this week. Like, no joke. I, I lost sleep. I, I, I immediately felt this burden for today, and, and the burden wasn't going to be lifted until love was spoken. And so truth has been spoken. Now I must speak love. I have seen divorce firsthand. It's nasty. I've witnessed it wreck intimacy and tear families apart. It creates confusion. It, it, it creates doubt. Children have split day holidays now. Spouses, they, they compete for the loyalty of their kids instead of raising them in the ways of the Lord together in unity before God. Stepbrothers and sisters, they attempt to find connection, but they struggle because it's not really their family. Instead of one Christmas, there are now four Christmases. And then there's the grandchildren. I don't, they're resilient, but you can't help but wonder what things could have been. What would it be like for them to see grandma and grandpa buried next to one another? What would the, how would that impact their view 
on marriage? How would that impact their faith? What would that look like for them? Look, there isn't some magic marriage pill. Nobody accidentally remains faithful to their spouse, just like nobody accidentally grows in their relationship with God. It requires daily vigilance from both the man and the woman to make their marriage a beautiful reflection of God's faithfulness. Some of you, God has brought you here today to hear this message so that you can return God to the center of your life. Because listen to me, if God is not at the center of your life, he won't be at the center of your marriage. He won't. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, it teaches that you can confess our backwards, we can confess our backwards priority and we can start new today. No guilt, no shame, just grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Start from grace and let's build from there. God can hit a bullseye with a broken arrow. He can. He's got you. The Bible is chock full of people who got off track. It's full of people who needed God's grace. They needed to be reminded of his love and his affection, but they also needed a new beginning. Because the way you love your spouse is one of the greatest testimonies of the way you love your God. And so I just want to invite you today, wherever this lands for you, fight for it. Fight for it. Yes, your pursuit will be imperfect, but never forget that God is a compassionate and gracious God slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word, though at times I admit 